when you go to jail, I had this sense of honor that even if, even if it, it really looking back, maybe it, it wouldn't be considered by most people as honor. But to me, to go to jail, and you know, I had the choice where I could have even, I mean, look, I could have went into the witness protection program. I could have even snitched and been a confidential informant, but I had to look at myself in the mirror. So I maintained my honor. I thought it was an honorable thing to do to accept your own, your own punishment for what you've done. And that was something, a decision I made. Look, I've, a lot of the guys who snitch say, well, I didn't do this and why should I pay for that? And, but they forget that all the bad things that they really have done and, and the, the fact that they are deserving of some form of punishment. They completely forget that. They don't mm. want to be punished. Mm. So I think that, you know, this sort of sense of honor that I had, I, you know, I, I, I feel like even if it wasn't, if you could say, well, gee, that's not honorable being a criminal and going to jail. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. But whatever, whatever I felt like motive, motivated me to sort of try to maintain that honor. Now, being a, a, a citizen who lives the proper way, I would still try to maintain it in every way. And, and that's it. Living up to your word. You know, doing what you, doing what you say you're going to do. Live up to your word. You know, don't talk about it. Be about it. It's something we used to say in the street and in jail. Don't talk about it. Be about it. It's the biggest killer in the mob. You know, when you think you're all powerful and you're not listening to anybody's advice, it's, it's almost time to go. And it's the same thing with the CEO of a company. When you think you're, you know, you're just this genius who knows how to do everything and doesn't have to listen to your team, doesn't need counselors, doesn't need advice from anybody. You're on, you're on the way out too pretty soon. So hubris is a big human killer. You know, whatever, whatever you pursue in this world, you have to always, I think, remain sort of grounded and realize that, you know, the people around you could, could like Lucky Luciano is a perfect example. Lucky Luciano, everything he did, he, he consulted. He had, he had a couple of Jews, he had a couple of Italians, he had a couple of, he had different guys that he would bounce things off of and they were looking at it from different perspectives and they'd give them their, their best sort of like answers and then he would take, wrap, you know, wrap it all around his head and figure it out, you know, what, what the best approach might be. So he was a perfect example. Capone, believe it or not, Al Capone, he comes across as like, you know, the way the press made him. He looks like this, uh, this buffoon who was running around Chicago just pushing booze. But if you get into the, the heart of who Al Capone was, he was actually a really smart man. And he had, again, he had Jews around him. He had Italians around him. He had a Welshman. He had a Polak. He had everybody you could think of. He never discriminated against anyone. He had everybody, you know, if you, if you were smart and you were trustworthy, you were worthy of being in his circle. And he listened to these people and he took advice from them. And if they were older than him, he, you know, he was 30 and, you know, the, the, a couple of guys who, who uh, Murray the Camel Humphreys, Jake Guzak, they were older than him, but he took advice from them if they, if they had sound advice. He didn't say, well, I'm older or I'm smarter or I'm the boss and you're not. He said, well, you know, what, 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 what direction should we take? And then he made the final decision. Those are the best bosses. You know, I mean, his mistake obviously was too much publicity, as was John Gotti's mistake. But they're not believed on. Capone and Gotti liked the camera. And, and you know, like my father's family was bodies. If they were walking in the house, you didn't even hear them. You didn't know. They were very, very low key. They wore like, you know, conservative gray, gray, gray pants. And my mother's family came in with big, bright yellows and purples and, you know, the, the big orange Cadillac and they had to hit the home when they pulled up, you know, and I'm not knocking Nobly Don's. They're beautiful people. I'm part Nobly Don. I'm, uh, I'm part Nobly Don, part Sicilian, and part Bades. But I'm just making the point that they're very, very colorful, loud people. And I think that's why Gotti and Capone sort of like the cameras, you know. But I think always, I think the wisest counsel as a rule of thumb, for the most part, comes from an older, older person. I think because experiences is where we learn most of who we, you know, who we are is based on, yeah, obviously all the experiences we have have to be sort of like, uh, uh, you know, how do you say like computerized in the mind? You gotta, you gotta digest them. You gotta, you know, take them in and, and ponder them and stuff. But, but for the most part, if you live, if you're a smart person to begin with, I assume, because you can't be, you know, there are people who are older and say, how did this guy get through 60 years or 70 years of life? But, but there are, for the most part, experiences are who we are and they sort of like form our thoughts. And the more you've been through, that's why like an old counselor, yeah, counselor of the family was always mm. old because he'd been there and done that. He'd seen so many things that if you sat down with him and you had a beef or you had an issue or, or you, he knew how to handle it because he'd been there and done that. And then in, in my time, 
they started replacing like 75, 80 year old consuliers with 40 year old guys. How are you going to compare? How are you going to compare the experiences of a 40 year old or the knowledge or wisdom of a 40 year old to that of an 80 year old? You can't. And it was, it was sort of, yeah, it was the death knell for, for a lot of the families. You know, Gas Pipe told this guy, Macaluso, who was 80, step down. You're no longer the consul. Yeah, he replaced him with somebody 40. John Gotti got rid of, you know, when, when Joe Piney was, was, was done, he, he put Sammy the Bull in there. Sammy the Bull was in there, a 40 something year old imbecile. What did he know about being a consul? Yeah. You know, he was a good pit bull if you wanted somebody dead, but not somebody to figure out how to keep peace. When his, his answer to everything was kill. That's the council, yeah, kill, kill, kill. That's like saying I'm going to put a secretary of state in to, who, who just wants to go to war and right. never talk to any other nations. How far are you going to get in life?